This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Legion In the pre-dawn gloom, as the chill wind whistles between the battlements, you see them for the first time. Thousands of them. The legion crests the distant ridge, spears poking at the sky and banners whipping. And as they begin to make their way down into the valley, you see how they are arranged. Ten massive blocks of soldiers, emblazoned in red and gold, bronze breastplates and helms shining despite the gloom of the morning. Each must consist of 500 troops. They march as one, like great bristling insects, two rows of five, flanked on either side by a line of horsemen. Soon, the battle will start. It has been said that an army marches on its stomach. We're not sure who said it. The quote has been attributed to both Napoleon Bonaparte and King Frederick the Great. Whoever said it, they were trying to emphasize the importance of good supply lines. If you wanted to keep your soldiers marching, you had to keep them fed. And if you wanted to stop an army, you could cut their supply lines. But, if you want an army to march at all, instead of, say, running along in a chaotic, jumbled mass, you need organization. And for military organization, no pre-modern civilization has surpassed the Romans. There were armies that were better trained and better equipped. There were armies that were bigger. There were armies that were more tactically skilled. But the Romans had the organization thing down cold. Which is why the word legion endures to this day. Whenever you have an army in a game or movie or book, and you want them to seem big and organized and unbeatable, you call them a legion. Today, We use the word legion to refer to armies and organizations and groups that are scary big and scary unified. Warcraft had its burning legion of demons. Mass Effect had its geth hive mind legion. Fallout had its legion of slavers. Magic the Gathering had the legion set, which was probably a big collection of cards if we know anything about Magic the Gathering. But we don't. And the real-life hacker group Anonymous adopted the phrase, We are Legion, to emphasize their numbers across the world. That last one, along with Mass Effect's Legion, is probably a biblical reference. Several of the Gospels tell the story of the exorcism of the Gerasene demons. But the Gospel of Mark seems to have the earliest and most detailed account. It seems Jesus was wandering a country called Gersini, or Jerash, in northern Jordan. He came upon a babbling man and realized the man was possessed by a demon. Jesus demanded that the demon come forth and give his name. See, this is a big thing. If you know the name of a demon, you can exercise it. The demon was understandably resistant, but it revealed that it was not a demon, but a horde of demons living in this guy's skull. My name is Legion, said the demon, for we are many. The demons then went on to beg Jesus not to exorcise them, but to instead send them into a flock of pigs nearby. Jesus complied, and the demons possessed the two thousand pigs and forced them to drown themselves in a nearby lake. For reasons. Actually, a lot has been written about this particular story and the interpretation of it. One interpretation is that the demons had intended to destroy the pigs all along and were using the swineherd to do it. Another is that the pigs destroyed themselves rather than be possessed by demons. 
And still another is that it's all a reference to the Roman legion being driven out of Palestine by the power of God. But this isn't the Bible scholar's word of the week, and we're not going to try to interpret that story. Instead, we're going to talk about the Roman legion. Once upon a time, round about 800 BCE, the word legion referred to the entire army of Rome. At that time, the army was under the command of the Etruscan kings. Who were the Etruscans? And why did they command the first Roman legion? Well, it's complicated. The founding of Rome is one of those stories that is so steeped in myth and legend that it's kind of hard to disentangle. The most famous myth goes like this. There was a king, Numitor, and he was overthrown by his brother, Amulius. It's a kind of Hamlet or Lion King setup. Amulius didn't want any Simbas or Hamlets showing up, so he had the kings killed and forced Numitor's wife, Rhea, to become a Vestal Virgin. Vestal Virgins, by the way, were priestesses of the goddess Vesta, and their virginity was tied to the honor of the goddess. So if they had sex, they were killed. But Mars, the Roman god of war, fell in love with Numitor's wife and had his way with her. She gave birth to two kids, Romulus and Remus. Amulius had Rhea and the kids thrown into the Tiber River. Rhea married the river god, happily, apparently, and the kids drifted downstream where they were found by a wolf, and the wolf raised them. Actually, that wolf thing is kind of interesting, because in Latin, the word lupa means both she-wolf and prostitute. In fact, one version of the story has the kids found by a shepherd whose wife is a former prostitute, and they raised the kids. But raised by wolves or a prostitute, the kids raised an army and restored their father to the throne. And then the kids decided to found a city. Each kid chose a specific hill on which that city should stand. When they couldn't settle the argument, they decided to resort to counting the birds on each hill as a sign of the gods' will. Romulus's hill had more birds, hence he started building his city there. But Remus made fun of Romulus's choice. As Romulus started to mark out the boundary of the city, Remus kept jumping over the line to show how defenseless the city would someday be. So Romulus killed Remus and founded Rome on Palatine Hill. As entertaining as that myth is, especially the part where Romulus literally kills his brother for crossing the duct tape line and coming over to his side, it's probably not true. Even if we assume the she-wolf was a prostitute, more than likely, Rome began as a village founded by an offshoot of the Latin tribe. See, in 1000 BCE, Italy was occupied by several different tribes, including the Latins and the Etruscans and a bunch of others. Technically, there is some argument as to whether the Etruscans were indigenous or migrated to Italy. It doesn't matter. The point is, a group of Latins gathered together and built a village near Palatine Hill. And they traded with the Greeks who occupied southern Italy and with the wealthy Etruscans to the north. At some point, the Etruscans invaded and they occupied the settlements around Palatine Hill, which they unified. And so, under the Etruscan occupation in BCE 625, Rome was officially founded. The original Roman legion consisted of exactly 3,000 soldiers and 300 horsemen. And, according to legend, one-third of each was under the command of each of the three founding Etruscan kings of Rome. But this, again, is steeped in mythology and of questionable veracity. Regardless, what we do know is that the original Roman legion was inspired by the Greeks, which was a common theme, 
a lot of Roman mythology actually rips off from the Greeks. But now you understand why. See, the Greeks had come up with this awesome battle formation called the Phalanx. You got a square of soldiers, called Hoplites, and you had them stand shoulder to shoulder. The outer soldiers interlocked their big shields. The rest of the soldiers had long pikes that they would thrust out between the shields. Basically, it was a tank or a spiked turtle, an impenetrable square of shielded soldiers bristling with sharp points. But the Roman legion didn't stop there. While the early Roman legion relied on the phalanx formation they had learned from the Greeks, it proved to be ineffective in battle against more mobile opponents. See, the thing was slow, like a tank or a spiked turtle. More organized, more maneuverable troops could run circles around it. At the same time, the Romans, now a distinct culture of their own combining Greek, Latin, and Etruscan culture, came up with a brilliant invention. A census. You heard us right. We didn't say the wrong word. Census. A census, as you might know, is just an accounting of all of your people. Basically, you count all of the citizens and you record basic information about them. But the census became central to the Romans' military organization. At the time, service in the military was obligatory. Every male Roman citizen had to serve in the army for a year. In addition, freed slaves and other non-Roman citizens could earn their citizenship by serving in the army. You've seen Starship Troopers or read the book? Basically, it's that system. What happened was, each citizen was graded into one of five classes, and that determined their position in the Roman army. The lowest class were given slings. That was it. They would just hurl rocks at the enemy. The wealthiest classes were outfitted like the Greek hoplites, spear, round shield, greaves, and breastplate. Elite citizens would enroll as equites and served as officers in cavalry. Ultimately, this led to the creation of a complex, well-organized, and eventually adaptable battle formation. In the front, you had light skirmishers. They were lightly armed and armored and also had javelins for throwing. They would lead the attack, skirmishing with the enemy. If things got too hot, the first line, the levies, would fall back. And then, the second line, the principes, would take over. They were experienced, well-armed, and well-armored. And if the principes needed support, they would fall back, and the third line would emerge. The triare were the most experienced and best-equipped soldiers. They were the last defense, and if things got desperate, the triare would hold the line and allow the rest of the army to retreat. Thus the Romans saying, it has come down to the triare, which basically means the poop has hit the fan. Over time, the legion evolved, particularly under the great general Scipio Africanus, who faced Hannibal and his elephants and ultimately kept the Carthaginians from taking Rome. But the basic principles remained the same. The lines were organized and adaptable, and by leading with weaker troops and allowing them to fall back as necessary, the Roman legion was able to avoid losing costly and experienced soldiers in minor skirmishes. And ultimately, the Roman army grew to an extremely well-organized army whose chain of command became the basis for Western military organization pretty much to the present day. It worked like this. First of all, the legion wasn't the entire army anymore. A legion consisted of about 5,000 soldiers. This included 100 horsemen and 10 cohorts. A, a cohort was a unit of 480 soldiers. 
the soldiers were divided into six centuries of 80 soldiers each, and each soldier belonged to a tent unit, which consisted of eight soldiers. If you want to get really technical, a legion was actually 5,240 soldiers. In addition to the 120 horsemen, it had nine normal cohorts and one special first cohort that consisted of five maniples or double centuries. See? They were organized. And there were some other interesting traditions. In a legion, for example, the first cohort was the veterans, the elite troops, the best of the best. The sixth cohort consisted of the best up-and-coming young soldiers. The eighth and tenth cohorts were honored soldiers who had proven themselves. The seventh and ninth cohorts were the weakest. That's where the raw recruits were, and the cohorts were arranged on the battlefield so that the strongest cohorts could help support the weaker ones. In fact, even their camps were organized. When the army camped, they would set up their eight-person tents in a grid pattern in four quadrants. At the center, the officers' quarters were established. Stables surrounded the tents. And the whole thing was surrounded by a ditch or a palisade, a fence made of logs driven into the ground. And in the center of the camp, the legion would display their banner. Now, all of this is interesting, but how do you use it in your game? Well, that's tricky, because fantasy role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons and Pathfinder aren't really concerned with mass combat. While they originated in the war games of the 1970s, they've gone in a different direction. That said, warfare often comes up in the worlds of fantasy adventure. Sure, we followed the adventures of Frodo and Aragorn and Orlando Bloom and Sala, but there were also these really cool wars going on in the background. And it's nice to have some sense of how the world works. The Roman army and its legions are a great template for the massive military empire that always seems to crop up in RPGs. And now, you have some sense of what those rows of troops would look like, marching across the battlefield, bristling with spears and protected by interlocking shields. And you know what their camps looked like. So you can run a cool infiltration, where the PCs have to sneak past rows of tents to the central command tent to steal the plans for the evil empire's new ultimate weapon so they can help the plucky rebellion. Or maybe we're thinking of something else. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.